Sean, I want to point out that that this is a um, not for sale promotional copy here, and it looks like I've been charged three dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Notify the authorities. Well then, I've finally been caught. Better a, lawyer up, a, Sean. Yeah, I had a good run. There's no point in fighting this. <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, author of a new children's book, The Feckless Fly and the Very Large Hat. (laughs) That's adorable. Thank you. I think there's some potential there. You've been writing a lot of books lately. Yeah, I've got a lot of free time as of late. (laughs) not leaving the house as much i don't know if you've been aware of the the general situation yeah yeah there's not yeah. there's just a shortage of bargain bin lps out there to sift through lately so no reason for sean to leave his house there's a pandemic peter maybe you didn't hear well boy i thought everyone knew and i was trying not to bring the podcast down by bringing it up Jeremy. Oh, but it's for historical records oh yeah for when people listen back in 30 years right yeah, yeah. When they check out our first episode of 2022, they'll hear about the pandemic as well. <laughs> Some fresh news about the the trending hot current events. Yeah, I'm sure our listeners appreciate keeping updated that it's still happening too. Yeah, especially since we record like two weeks behind <laughs> when we release episodes. Don't tell them. I'm Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. Co-host Jeremy Ruggles? Yeah. That's you? That's me. All right. Well, if that's all you have to say, then I'm co-host Peter Cook. And I just want to say, here, all we have here is sky. All the sky is blue. All that blue is one more color now. That was poetic. Thank you, co-host Peter. You're welcome. And I'm I'm James Duke, and I'm a fireplace videotape connoisseur. Oh, that's accurate. I've watched a lot of them this year, and you know what? They don't make them like they used to, folks. These kids on YouTube, they get a 10-second high-definition clip, and they just loop that sucker. It's not the same. There's no dedication to the craft. Back in the 80s, you would actually set that camera up in front of a real fire. You would tend that fire. You would wear nice gloves. Some people have respect for the form. Some yeah. People, now, okay, so we're talking about the classic fireplace videos. Is there, is there any uh, more recent ones that you can recommend that have the James Duke stamp of approval? I mean, there's a million of them on YouTube, but like I said, nothing beats those VHS tapes. The old-fashioned crafters. Old-time religion. Are there any like modern crafters, like really... You know, living up to the art form. I mean, we might be the final champions. Oh. My favorite Queen song, We Might Be the Final Champions. <laughs> <laughs> well, James, welcome back to the podcast. You were here like about exactly a year ago or just about talking Vinnie Bell airport love theme with us. Gosh, that was so fun. Thank you guys for having me. I I just want to say... Long time listener, second time caller, and being friends with all of you, of course, it's very charming to fall asleep most evenings listening to the three of you have a conversation. And sometimes I even forget that I'm not on the pod and I start to respond when one of you says something Aww. and remind myself, oh, yes, I'm, I'm just an observer. So glad to be back. Well, we're glad to have you, and I, I feel like sometimes I might we might start to get a tingle of your responses in, in our conversations as we're having them. You know, we, we see the future and what you'd want to say to us. But tonight, today, you get to talk to us in The person. genuine artifact, the real James Duke. What'd you bring us, James Duke? I've got a record that I actually picked up from my favorite 
Bargain Bin, which can be found online at DJ Hard Bargain's Discogs shop. Yes. Um, every once in a while, I feel like it's my duty to help him clear out some of his Bargain Bin LPs, and I highly recommend that you all sort by low to high on uh, Sean Hartman's Discogs page, because that's how I found this record. It is called The Speckless Sky, and it's by an artist named Jane Sibbery, which rhymes with slippery. Yeah. I'm glad that you figured it out because I wasn't sure. My brain would have seen it differently. This came out in 1985 on a label called Open Air. There's a lot of uh, lot to unpack here, but uh, how about we just get started with a song, James? Where do you want to start us? I want to start side one, track one, with the song One More Color. Beautiful. And this was the single, right? This was a hit single. A hit single, yes. This record has a really interesting combination of the up-tempo, synth-pop, new wave kind of vibe, but it also just has like these arrangements behind it that give it this spacey kind of flowing uh, vibe as well. It's an interesting combination of those two things throughout, and I love that sound. That song was like the most normal sounding song in this whole record, though. The rest of it, like you said, the arrangements get real bizarre. And then texturally, it's it's very interesting to me. There's a a mishmash of like textures you don't normally hear mixed with like comically eighties textures. Just like stuff. Yeah, it's, that, it's very brittle at times. Yeah. That song in particular Kind of sounded like something that might be in the Americanized version of a Miyazaki movie to me. Oh, Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the digital flute. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, some of those elements and textures. Yeah, the layering is really charming to me on this record. And I think you're right, uh, Jeremy, that it's funny that they chose that song as track one, side one. And this song was actually uh, a fairly big hit for uh, Jane Sibri in Canada and actually charted in the U.S. briefly as well. Probably one of her biggest brushes with fame, but the rest of the record is very different. It, the way I would describe this record with the single and, and the rest of the uh, tracks in mind, when I first got it, I was playing it 
uh, for a friend, and I said, "This re- this sounds like store brand Kate Bush." Yeah. Yep. Very Kate Bush influenced, I imagine. Yeah. To me, it it seems like Kate Bush always has a very like theater student quality to her music, and this is more like your crafting neighbor music <laughs> like your neighbor that makes a lot of different crafts and gets involved in a lot of that yeah it kind of is like a bedroom pop or like indie bedroom kind of vibe a little bit absolutely yeah there's like a lightheartedness to it and you can tell there's a there's like a sense of unbridled creativity going on which is fascinating yeah and i i think she has some diy roots that makes sense how she got how she got started which i'm sure we'll explore <laughs> So, James, were you familiar with this record before you bought it from me, or was this a a blind buy, or what made you pick this up? As I said, I feel like it's my duty every few months to go to DJ Hard Bargain's Tiscox page and sort LPs from low to high, and then just add random ones to my cart. I recommend it. It's very cheap entertainment. And uh, I didn't know anything about this record going into it, so it was a pleasant surprise. Wow, what a very modern, virtual way to bargain bin (laughs) hunt whatever works whatever keeps you safe tell me what this is james i don't this record yeah i don't understand what i don't understand how this came to exist listening to it that was a thought i had it's a great question i'm not entirely sure either i think there are a lot of different possible answers the thing about jane sibri is she's an artist that really likes to play with personalities and narratives and kind of reinvent who she is frequently. And so there are interviews and and there is some official information, but all of it is, it it tells the story of somebody who likes to play with personas and try out different types of characters. And so this record to me, it feels like almost a character study, but there are several different characters that aren't really defined. And they're all, they're all having these experiences that are, they're kind of in tension between kind of a modern, up-tempo, exciting lifestyle and more of a rural theme where there are more pastoral images and concepts of inner peace and and reflection. And it's all kind of jumbled together in a, in a really playful way, kind of a fun way. Hmm. I like that interpretation. Um, I'd love to show you a second exhibit to highlight my point, if we may. Let's do that. Can we listen to the second track? Seven Steps to the Wall. Oh, yeah. Seven Steps to the Wall.
as we were listening to that, someone commented that they heard some Cindy Lopper in there, and I would absolutely agree. Uh, and then maybe it shifts into more of a Laurie Anderson type thing. I think someone else said. Yeah, I. That those are definitely the vibes I was getting from the beginning of this song. Yeah, this song's a step into the weirder stuff, but even that one wasn't as strange as some of these songs get. Yeah, I like how it kind of bridges that gap between you know, the poppy main single of the album and the rest of its layers and melodies. I think it's fun because it it does start to get more complex and musically interesting, but at the same time it retains a very keen knack for nice melodies that are very memorable and get stuck in your head. For sure. Can you tell us more about Jane? Yeah, so her father was a Merrill Lynch executive in Toronto, which is kind of funny to me. When I first read that, it reminded me of artists like Ezra Koenig or St. Vincent who have rich parents. And I think some people kind of scoff at that type of circumstance in some ways. Ezra Koenig from Vampire Weekend, right? Correct, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I, when I say that, I'm not trying to paint this as a negative. To me, it's a sign that you know, if there were less income inequality and, and it was easier for young people to loaf around and make art pop records like this, that's what I want, right? Spread, let's spread it around. Let's get uh, more art pop. Think about all the records like this that haven't been made because people's parents aren't bankers. So um, she started out playing piano as a child. She was very focused on classical music. Initially, her parents had aspirations for her and she ended up studying music in college, but went a little bit of a different direction and got a degree in uh, in science and microbiology, but still continued to play music. She would play in local cafes and uh, would collaborate with people uh, that she knew in lots of different types of bands and actually scored a minor hit with a song in 1984 called Mimi on the Beach. Mimi. Is that a song that... Mimi. Mimi, Mimi on the Beach. <laughs> um, it was a, kind of a surprise hit because it was, like we've talked about so far... A little bit different than what you would expect to hear for a mainstream single. It was seven and a half minutes long, so quite a bit longer than you would expect for a radio hit. And on the strength of that hit, uh, this she recorded this follow-up album, The Speckless Sky, which actually went gold in Canada. Wow. And this song, One More Color, that we started off with has a, a pretty funny music video. She's, like we talked about earlier, there are pastoral themes mixed with that kind of Toronto urban narrative. And so she's running around with a cow on a leash, like it's a dog. And it's a, it's very enthusiastic and it has a lot of energy. Yeah. It kind of further for me, I watched that. And for me, it further confirmed my notion that she's your rural crafty neighbor as opposed to your theater kid. Yeah. I can see that. It's very Canadian. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Yes. Very much so. I've seen Letter Kenny, so that's what I'm assuming Canadian means. I think, Sorry to our Canadian listeners. Yeah, I think our get, former guest Lauren might be coming back on next time <laughs> to correct us on a few things. <laughs> or maybe she's not coming back now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just burned that bridge. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren, I didn't mean it. Canadians are cool. Heck yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely mean that as a compliment to Canadian culture, right? It has a, for, for a country with such a great rural expanse, but also these major metropolitan centers, it does have that kind of tension carried within it. And this is a great expression of that. Yeah, and I had read that, you know, it, as kind of coming up and establishing herself, she had funded a lot of this herself, the, as far as like recording her albums and getting the funding for touring and whatnot, this label that uh, she's on open air. I didn't really find a whole lot of information about that either. I don't know if and it's also Duke street records and open air records is what this was released on. That's actually why I picked up the uh, LP because of the uh, Duke street <laughs> records cosign there. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're right, Peter. I think she did have, a brush with fame after this record was released. Like I said, it did go gold and she actually was then signed to Warner brothers and um, they gave her some advance money to record a third album, which was quite a bit more dense than this called the walking, but that album didn't produce the same hits. And so I think she ultimately 
you know, renegotiated the terms of the of the recording contract that she had and, and was totally content walking away and continuing to self fund, you know, her career and, and the direction that she wanted to go after that experience. So Open Air Records is actually a division of Wyndham Hill Records, which is one of the bigger new age ambient kind of labels. So it seems like a a little bit of a weird pairing. I mean, there's some elements of ambient and new age experimentalism in here, but I would not categorize this as a new age record. Two of the main other acts that were on Open Air Records was Michael Hedges, the acoustic guitar virtuoso, and the Nylons, who I think were like a kind of poppy jazz vocal group. Yeah. Yeah, those are the the names that kept coming up when I was looking at the Open Air catalog. (laughs) Yeah. Weird association. I maybe that has something to do with why this record didn't take off as much in the States. If it had been on a a label that made more sense and could have done something with it, who knows what could have happened. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about Jane, James. Well, like I said, she was, she is, continues to perform. Throughout her career, she has played with this concept of persona. And she, after her major label uh, debut, The Walking, she ended up walking away from that contract and producing more albums that went in a lot of different directions. She experimented more with jazz. She recorded folk standards. She actually did a concept album of songs that she wrote as a teenager, which I imagine myself going on a journey like that and it'd be, I think, deeply painful. So kudos to her for having the courage to do that. Um, she made field recordings. Of course, she made a, you know a Christmas record. She's had a very eclectic career. She performed over, under several different personas. Uh, one called Issa made several records and had a whole backstory and narrative associated with that. So more characters and storytelling. Exactly. She's she was one of the first artists to institute a pay your own price policy for selling records online, uh, predating good old Radiohead by a few years, and she also did some house show touring uh, in the aughts and uh, in 2010s. In fact, I, if I'm remembering correctly, didn't she play at the No Fun House during a snowstorm for like seven or eight people? Uh, you... I don't oh, wow. think. What? Am I imagining this? It might have been a dream. Okay. I'm... This is Sean's <laughs> former house venue we're talking about here. I mean, if it did happen, I would feel like a complete fool, but I have no memory of this, so... No, I think that was a joke. uh, (laughs) I mean, just to to paint the picture for the audience, you know, she embarked on that kind of a DIY tour, right? Playing in small uh, college towns across across Canada and the United States. I think the I think the DIY tour was through Europe, actually, from what I had read, but it may have taken place in uh, several different areas. Yeah, she did a few of them, and and sometimes would go with friends and under pseudonyms and things like that. Uh, Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I also read that uh, after she instituted the pay what you can thing, she started making more money from her like solo self-released album sales. Yeah, I think she has a bit of a cult following. Like people that are into her get very into it, right? And so that's given her, uh, in addition to you know uh, being able to self fund a lot of these projects, it's given her a lot of creative freedom. That's but, awesome. Yeah, that makes sense, and I could see her music being like a big influence on younger musicians that came after her, especially, you know, some of the more experimental indie pop artists that were coming up in the mid nineties. You know, I saw that she'd worked with members of the breeders and I don't know, just thinking about other experimental indie pop bands. I mean, you could even say like pavement and stuff like that has some uh, inspiration from artists like this from earlier on that were challenging what was happening with the new music and bringing some interesting creative ideas to the table. Yeah. One of the songs when I was listening to it, it had these like tempo changes and these like hard stop, like total shifts into a different thing that reminded me a lot of, of Montreal, which is a band that I like that maybe people have heard of. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There's that sense of jubilant excitement that both artists share. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Well, James, do you have another selection you'd like to play? Yeah, I'd love to hear the song Mind Bitte. All right, that is side B, track one. I want a good day. Thank you. 
love the chord changes on that last song. You know, many of you probably have had that experience now over this holiday of 2021 where maybe you were hanging out with your folks and watched a little bit of that Beatles documentary online. And uh, every boomer has their opinion about what made the Beatles so great. My dad, Leonard Duke, told me when I was a kid that one of the reasons why the Beatles were great is because they did really, really great things with conventional pop structures. And one of the things that they did that was so interesting was they would insert these fun jazz chords in places you wouldn't expect them uh, for transitions between choruses and verses and bridges. And it just made the songs such a delight to hear and so different than uh, than everything else on the radio. And that song has a couple changes like that that remind me of things I like about interesting Beatles songs. Yeah, Whenever I go to try to learn a Beatles song by just looking up the chords, there's always some chord that I'm like, what on earth is that chord? <laughs> it's, you know, like you said, it's usually some transitional chord. That it's just a strange choice, and you realize that's what kind of made it stand out. Absolutely. You don't quite know where you're being led, but you're excited to go there, right? It's very E.E. E. Cummings. Yeah. I found the lyrics of that song interesting now having some context around jane and her upbringing it was uh i felt like perhaps it was kind of uh pushing back against her upbringing perhaps yeah absolutely it the album for all of its innocence and kind of naive vocal themes or lyrical themes has distinct class awareness at several different points you can tell yeah, I didn't pick up on it on that first listen through, but listening back with like some knowledge on that now, it uh, adds some adds another layer to it. You ready to interpret Jane's lyrics? I'm ready now. Well, would you guys like to hear about who these musicians are that Jane has taken into the speckless sky with her? Tell us. On drums, we have a fellow named Al Cross from the Canadian band Big Sugar. And he also worked with Lorena McKennett. Do you guys know that name at all? No. Nope. She had a hit, a surprise hit, in the late 90s with a song called The Mummer's Dance. Nope. Nope, not ringing a bell. Lorena McKennett, another big Canadian name. On guitar and guitar synth, we have noted Canadian guitarist and composer Ken Murr who also worked with the Cowboy Junkies, and in 2020 won a Canadian Screen Award for his score to the documentary The Accountant of Auschwitz. So he's still out there getting recognition as recently as 2020. Cool. Which is two years ago now because it's 2022, y'all. Whoa. True. <laughs> Not ready for it. I know. <laughs> On bass, we have John Switzer. A Canadian bassist and producer who worked regularly with Jane 
Why would that be James Duke? Tell us. Oh, they were romantic partners for quite some time, and they obviously had musical chemistry as well. They worked together on several different records, on on these and other recordings uh, with other friends in their musical circle. Uh, They did split up romantically after the release of the third album, but they continued to collaborate together in a professional uh, working relationship. Wonderful. Yep, they co-produced this album together. John Switzer and Jane Sibbery. On keyboards, we have Anne Bourne, a Toronto-based cellist and keyboardist. I found that she has worked with Fred Frith from Henry Cow. So that was an interesting connection. And behind the Fairlight programming, the synth programming, is a man named Rob Yale. I saw that he also worked with Bruce Coburn. Wow. That was the most noteworthy name I could find connected with Rob Yale. It seems like he did a lot of synth programming. Someone's got to do it, right? True. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Rob Yale's up to the task. So those are just some of the people helping make all these interesting and, u- and unique sounds with Jane here on the speckless sky. Radical. Sean Dead, is there music like this? The only thing that comes to mind immediately is Kate Bush, but those records aren't cheap. Yeah, some of the Kate Bush you can find for like, you know, 10 and under, but you're probably not going to find any Kate Bush in any dollar bins. So being this being the first episode of the new year, we're going to say goodbye to making accompanying playlists with every episode. Uh, it was a fun run, and we're just kind of done with it, and we're switching it out to just naming a small handful of recommended albums. So if you like this and you want to find something similar, I would first recommend getting yourself a copy of Laurie Anderson's Big Science from 1982. This record was like everywhere 10 years ago when I started record collecting, and it's gotten just slightly harder to find, but still a fairly common record. As we said, like a lot of the more experimental elements and the spoken word stuff reminded me a lot of Lori Anderson. Highly recommend that album. And then another one that I think reflects some of the more up-tempo and goofy elements on this album, I would recommend Altered Images, Pinky Blue from 1982. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then another 1982 record, I would highly recommend Yoko Ono's It's All Right, I See Rainbows. That's the follow-up to the critically acclaimed album Seasons of Glass. It's All Right has this weird kind of melancholy synth pop vibe like everything is fucked up but we're gonna try our best to be happy regardless <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that might uh feel kind of relevant in these modern times to some people and then two records that we've covered on the show before cindy lopper's she's so unusual from 1983 and tony basil's word of mouth from 1981 yeah I I think it, on one of the tracks we listened to, I definitely at one point thought back to Tony Basil, which, you know, this is uh, on the surface, this is a, a much more serious and uh, record with, you know, artistic integrity. And I don't know if that's what anyone would describe that Tony Basil album as, but there's some interesting experimental moments on that, that record. Exactly. Yep. A fun album that gets weirder than you thought it would. Exactly. Those are my recommended, if you like, Jane Sibbery picks. I've got one as well. Um, yeah. Strange Mercy by St. Vincent is a record that came to mind for me. It, I think it was really released maybe in 2010 or 2011, but it does have a similar thread through it of layered melodies and kind of deviant rhythms that never really lose you if you're, if you're seeking the heart of the song. Right? That's the real charm of this record for me is that so often we think about experimental music and we think about pop music or we think about the complex uh, as these kind of poles that have to be so far apart from each other. But it's really quite charming how they're woven together on the speckless sky. Yeah, yeah. that's a, a great comparison for a more modern musician. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. St. Vincent, too. Annie from St. Vincent, she is clearly into some weird stuff. I saw her performing a pop group cover on like it was on I think it was on Jimmy Fallon live or something about 10 years ago 
just so unexpected. And she, you know, she's playing it like note for note. <laughs> and have any of you seen that? No, I have not seen. It's that out one. there. All right, I'll have to check it. Check it out. Well. I think that's that's about it. Do we have any final thoughts before we play out the last track? I want James to plug something about himself and not your record store, Sean. <laughs> I mean, but if he wants to plug the record store a third time, no, I'm not going to stop him. DJ Hard Bargain on Discogs. Let's see my plugs. I like to draw psychedelic posters and I will do it for you quite cheap if I like your music. So if you are needing promotional artwork for your psychedelic rock band or you just want a psychedelic motif in general for your normal band, then please visit me online at redundanteuphoria.space. I can confirm that he does rad drawings. He's done a few tour posters and gig things for me personally so it's great it's and great what you do james many flyers for my previous dj gigs and he's also done our uh, little have a uh, little cartoony avatar picture oh god i podcast. forgot yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. our like podcast logo was done by this man james duke <laughs> it's good to be here you've been with us from the start and always effectively True. When you have an awkward pause in the pod, it was then that I was responding. To That's you. what I'm saying. We can feel that tingle <laughs> of you responding in the future. <laughs> well, excellent, James. And and while you're here, if you if you don't mind, uh, before we get out of here, I'm gonna we're overdue. We're in 2022, and in season three, we have not done an installment of For the Record, where we correct misinformation stated in previous episodes of the podcast. We set the record straight. Let's cleanse ourselves. Let's cleanse ourselves. So going back to the end of season two on our Carol King episode, we said that Jazzman won a Grammy. Well, it was nominated for a Grammy for Best Pop Vocal Performance, but lost to Olivia Newton-John, I Honestly Love You. That was a robbery. I Let know. me just say that. Yeah. Agreed. Also on that episode, to clarify something, we said that Carol King had only been inducted into the Rock Hall in 2021. That was slightly incorrect. King had been inducted into the Rock Hall in 1990 as a songwriter, along with her writing partner and former husband, Jerry Goffin. And in 2021, she was she was inducted a second time as a performing artist. All right, going to the beginning of season three now, our first episode of season three, Lou Rawls. I could find nothing to indicate that the Teenage Kings of Harmony and the Highway QCs were the same group. But it is interesting to note that the Highway QCs are still active over 60 years later. We could find them. We, we could, could find, ask them directly. That's, that's true. <laughs> Book them. Book them on pod. Yeah. Primary sourcing. Come on. To I feel like that's an inevitable path for this podcast, if you guys don't mind me uh, trying to influence your direction. I, I want to see the uh, the reunion pod, you know? I want to see you get get a band back together here. Ooh. That would be cool. Uh, I mean, we have been discussing reaching out to some of these artists that we cover and maybe have them on to say a few words about their records. We've reached out to one that didn't work out, but uh, it'll happen sometime, you know. We'll keep trying. We'll keep growing. We got to build our clout. That's right. So tell your friends. <laughs> Review us on Apple Podcasts. Build us that clout, and we'll get the, we'll get the celebrities on board. <laughs> a few more items to go over in this installment of For the Record. On our Weather Report episode, we need to correct. We stated that Wayne Shorter played on Kind of Blue by Miles Davis, that is incorrect. That would be John Coltrane that performed on Kind of Blue. Same difference. <laughs> Ever heard of him? <laughs> and we want to thank our listener, Joseph, for pointing that out to us. So thank you, Joseph. Also, another listener reached out to us uh, on another item in that episode. Badia. We, we, said, we mentioned Badia, and we didn't know what it meant. Apparently, it means the desert in Arabic. 
And we want to thank our listener, Hamid, for that bit of information. Peter, I wanted to mention Wayne Shorter and Miles together. If you're really craving a record featuring those two musicians, might I recommend ESP. Definitely not a dollar bin record. But worth checking out. But worth checking out. Wayne Shorter. Also, Herbie, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, Tony Williams. Fantastic record. You can't go wrong with that oh, wow. one. That's wow. an all-star. All right, one final thing. On our Chris Williamson episode, we referred to Laura Nero's version of Stone Soul Picnic as a cover, but Laura Nero wrote the song Stone Soul Picnic, and her version was released a few months before the popular version by The Fifth Dimension. Oh, all right, cool. So that ends another installment of For the Record, where we set the record straight on misinformation stated in previous episodes of I'd Buy That for a Dollar. And I think we're just about about ready to wrap up with this episode on Jane Sibbery. Thank you so much for bringing this along, James. This is a pretty unique record, I feel like, for stuff we've covered so far on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to share it with all of you and the audience, of course, and looking forward to reading some comments from folks who might come across it out in the wild. Yeah, I'm personally looking forward to picking up a copy of this album next time I see it and getting to know it a little better. I played through as much as I could getting ready for this episode and definitely had the feeling that it would, uh, it would need a handful of plays to really understand the whole thing. So Mm -hmm. I would say side two, especially really blooms after a few listens. Okay. Looking forward to it. Yeah. It definitely takes a, a few spins by the time we got ready for the episode. I was like, I'm really starting to feel these songs and, and we'll say you will find this album cheap it is a very cheap album <laughs> if you find it out there you if if you paid five bucks i'd, I'd be surprised well, of course now that we've covered it it's going to be like a 20 dollar record i'd buy that bump <laughs> yeah it's unique and it's it's a, an outlier in being extraordinarily cheap but being intensely unique and creative which typically bolsters the value of records but if it was a gold record, I mean, they made a lot of copies, so makes sense. I wonder if this record gets harder to find the farther south you get from Canada. Could be. You gotta be up here in Minneapolis. Yeah. Get that direct shipping from Sean Hartman. <laughs> Closer to the border. Get those imports. All right. Well, happy 2022. Thank you for listening to I'd Buy That for a Dollar. Thank you, James Duke, for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm a. Uh, I'm gonna get off. I'm gonna log off the pod, and then I'm gonna go listen to the Christmas episode upstairs. So it's a nice. good one. Christmas is over, but that's fine. <laughs> it's actually his fourth time listening to it. Oh my god! Second. <laughs> like I said, I like to fall asleep to it. It's it's very comforting, Jeremy. Aw. Plus, there's there's twelve days of Christmas. We've just begun. Oh man! Christmas is in the heart. <laughs> oh man. So what are we leaving on, James? Um, I'd like to highlight the tension between rural and urban themes really coming to a head here on one of the final tracks of the album. Is it the final track of the album? The Empty City. N- no, I think it's, it's it's not. It's the second song on side B. Definitely feels like a, a highly anticipated moment after that um, Mind Bitter track. Yeah. All right. Well, that's what we're going to leave on. One thing I like about this track, can I just mention this? One thing that really charms me about this record is the way that it plays with rhythm. And a few of these tracks have moments that genuinely trick the listener into thinking that the record is skipping. You know, they're, they're cut out, they repeat, uh, lines of melody repeat, vocal lines repeat, instrumental parts will repeat. Sometimes they'll all be in sync with each other. Sometimes they'll be slightly out of sync with each other. And it, it, the effect is very disorienting. It kind of reminds me of vaporwave, uh, more, more heady vaporwave tracks. Thank you, James Duke. All right, I'm Jeremy. Good night, good morning, or good day. I'm, I'm Sean. Peter Cook. Can I, can I say that? I'm Sean. Yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm Sean. I'm Peter Cook. Goodbye. Yeah, I'm the city. The shit inside the tire. I thought that I was kidding when I said I like the sun. I love the skyline. Tower 
sparks rising from the trees White bars on a blue graph Not exactly a flap in the breeze Cast upon a great white plaza Filtered down through architects' maps A stand of glassy superstructures On the sprawling city flats Streaming to the blue sea I'm in sky, green like beluga, beluga, producing the teeming atoms and shimmering in the haze. Oh.